you and getting to put some faces, some names, and some emails. But first I wanted to give you just a brief update about what we've been doing on the student side at George Mason, the social entrepreneurship. So one thing is we have a student group that Paul mentioned, which is Mason Changemakers, and that is basically a student group that spreads awareness about social entrepreneurship in different ways. So it's been growing, it started out very small, but we have a very active group now, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, and then we also have a student consulting group, which is called SVC, or Social Venture Consulting, and we consult local nonprofits on different areas. We actually have one of our advisors here today, Kristen, because um, we work with Booz Allen Hamilton Advisors who help us make sure that we have a very quality, a high quality product for the nonprofits that we're working for. So those are just a few things we are, we're currently doing. But um, I was, the main reason I'm up here is in, to introduce Phil Alzerwald. He is a professor at the School of Public Policy, and he is the founding editor, or one of them, for Innovations Journal. And he also was, with Paul, one of the main people who brought Ashoka initially to the campus so that I could get involved and other people like me could get involved. So, Phil, if you'd like to come up here and speak. Great. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, more than a couple of years ago, Marina, Kim, and I uh, were talking about how George Mason might get a little bit more involved with Ashoka, and we um, had some discussions about uh, possibly doing an executive education program on the Arlington campus, and uh, Marina said that she had had some conversations with other schools in the area, but was willing to think about restarting that and possibly doing it at, uh, at George Mason. And uh, then, as things happened in Ashoka, uh, Marina uh, got together a team of people, and they spent a summer thinking about what they might do in their uh, initiatives in higher education. And at the end of that, they said, we have an idea, and we're wondering if you'd like to be part of it. And the idea that they had was to create a set of team, a team of teams, to um, be uh, change agents in higher education. And the way that this would work is that uh, a pair of committed faculty members on selected campuses, selected by Ashoka in a competitive process, um, and exceptionally dedicated students would take it upon themselves to try to bring social entrepreneurship to their campuses and really make social entrepreneurship a centerpiece of everything uh, that was taking place across the instructional programs, research, outreach, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> and so uh, George Mason um, was... Uh, uh, Marina invited us to apply, and we were accepted in the pilot year of that program. And now um, it has really grown into uh, something that is on the cusp of really realizing some of its initial aspirations. And in part, that's because of the transformations that are happening in higher education, generally speaking. And uh, in part, it's because of the currency of social entrepreneurship in the generation that's being served in today's colleges and universities. So among the Changemaker campuses today are Tulane University, where their president, Scott Cowan, has really rededicated the entire university towards the mission and objectives of social entrepreneurship, and is in the process of trying to raise a fund on the order of $100 million to help transform uh, New Orleans uh, with Tulane as a core leadership partner. So um, the first thing I want to do is just acknowledge Marina, who's here, who's the leader of this effort, who's done an amazing job building this, and to thank her and, of course, my wonderful partner uh, who has been just a tremendous colleague, I think one of the most supportive and encouraging professional relationships I've had at George Mason, has been working with Paul on this Changemaker Campus project, and Whitney and the other students we worked with, the only exposure I've had to working with undergraduates, and if any of the rest of the undergraduates on this campus or anything like the, uh, the uh, Whitney and Alex and others that I've worked with, then it's really a remarkable group. So anyway, thank you, uh, Marina. Um, yeah. That's just to situate Change Market Campus. I'm going to uh, proceed uh, rapidly to, to introducing uh, Derek. In fact, I'm going to have to walk over here because your bio is on my phone. So. <laughs> um, but uh, just another note about Ashoka, what I've handed out to you is a recent announcement uh, from the Changemakers Group. Now Ashoka is, um, is sort of an incubator of projects. Uh, there are a number of different entities within Ashoka. Ashoka U is one. Uh, I would say there are probably uh, 10, maybe 20 uh, just sort of distinct 
activities. One of them is Change Makers, so it's not affiliated with Ashoka U. And uh, just to give you an indication of what Ashoka does, um, recently the, uh, the, the leaders of the G20 nations, the 20 uh, leading economies in the world, when they uh, met in, the, in Seoul, uh, announced the winners of the SME Finance Challenge competition that these uh, group of world leaders had put together to award $500 million to organizations that were uh, dedicated to advancing entrepreneurship, for process business entrepreneurship around the world. The organization that the G20 chose to administer that competition was not the World Bank, not the United Nations, not Harvard University, not Stanford University, it was Ashoka. So that gives you some sort of an indication of the level at which Ashoka plays. They are our neighbors down in Roslyn, they are our partners in Changemaker Campus, but they're also engaged at the highest level globally in advancing their mission. The other and the primary thing that, that Ashoka does is to uh, recognize fellows, currently 2,500 fellows in 70 countries around the world who are outstanding social entrepreneurs like, and now finally to our speaker, Derek Ellerman. Um, and when you hear Derek, uh, just uh, you know, momentarily, you'll see how, how extraordinary the work of Ashoka uh, Fellows is. And that there are 2,500 fellows recognized all around the world who are working uh, on a regular basis with Ashoka really shows that sort of the power of their network and the, the, the model they've developed over 20 years. So Derek is the co-founder former co-executive director and current chairperson of the board of directors of the Polaris Project. Uh, Derek supervised the development and implementation of Polaris Project programs in the United States and Japan, an expert on US-based sex trafficking networks. Uh, Derek has trained and worked closely with federal and local law enforcement, testified before the US Congress, and worked directly with survivors of trafficking. He's been featured in various media, including National Public Radio, The Washington Post, several uh, network news shows, um, and uh, currently he is speaking at George Mason University for you and me. So, <laughs> anyway, welcome to Derek Ellen. Great, thank you so much everyone for coming today. Um, it's uh, great to come out here. I actually just drove out this morning from West Virginia, where I recently moved. Uh, where I was just telling Whitney, it's 15 degrees and snowing, so <laughs> relatively speaking out here, it's, it's a balmy 35 and, and there's sun, which is great. Um, it's really good to be uh, at JMU. This is actually the first time I've come out to campus. Uh, Polaris Project, we've had the opportunity to work with a number of really stellar um, students and alumni through our fellowship program, uh, which is a program that we have that invests in young leaders in the trafficking field. And uh, we also have a partnership with the social work program um, where some of the MSW students are actually placed in our client services and are able to work with uh, some of our clients who are coming out of trafficking situations in the greater DC area. Um, so there's been a number of different um, sort of partnerships with, with uh, GMU in the past and it's great to interface with now the social innovation work that's, that's happening here on campus. Um, the field of social entrepreneurship has been growing over the last 20 years, um, but I think it's really uh, it's really exploded into the mainstream really just in the last, I'd say, five or six years. Um, you're constantly hearing news reports about it. It's really mainstreamed at many different levels. Um, and the central premise of the field that, you know, there's certain people or small groups of people who, if they have the right mix of innovative thinking, and passion, and skills, can create really transformational social solutions um, that on their own merit catch on in scale, and that these leaders and these organizations have a very disproportionate impact in their fields and on society at large. That idea has really had a very powerful impact, uh, certainly in the nonprofit sector in general, and the social change space in general, um, in philanthropy, uh, and increasingly in government, and and right here in, in higher education, um, many of the the sort of best and the brightest that ten years ago might have been, you know, going into investment banking. Um, thankfully, these days are not going into investment banking, but are actually starting up their own organizations. 
um, they're actually starting as social ventures either as students on campus or right afterwards. Um, and so I think colleges and universities are really beginning to understand the real demand out there from these student social entrepreneurs and social innovators for more support and more space on campus uh, to help them be successful during their time as students and afterwards. And, and I think that you know, universities are also really understanding that as alumni, these students are not only making incredibly valuable and important contributions to society, but their work is also deeply inspiring to the entire university community, uh, both to the student body and to alumni and to faculty. Um, so it's, it's really great to see, you know, as, as a social entrepreneur, where I started my work um, on a college campus and then launched Flyers Project right afterwards, it's really great to see, even in the last eight years, how much things have changed. Because um, uh, you know, when we started back in 2002, um, I can definitely say that, in general, the notion wasn't out there as much, but particularly the level of support and the level of programming like you're seeing here at GMU, just in general, did not did not exist. So, I think that I think that we're we're at a real kind of transition point in the social entrepreneurship field right now. Um, I think a lot of the last um, decade and the two decades before that have been focused around a model similar to sort of the venture capital model in the for-profit sector, um, a search and selection model of looking for where are the leaders in the organizations that really have the greatest amount of potential and you know, shining a spotlight on those organizations to make sure that not only are they going to, you know, <coughs> hopefully survive the most difficult period, which is usually their infancy when they're first starting up, but they're, they're really going to be able to thrive and scale out their social solutions. And that's been a lot of, a lot of the focus um, to date, and it's been very important as sort of a proof of concept that, in fact, you know, there isn't just sort of this undifferentiated mass of different organizations and different fields, but in fact there are certain certain organizations, certain leaders, certain general strategies and new, new ideas that really do have this sort of disproportional impact uh, in their fields and in society. But I think we're, we're coming to kind of the next stage of evolution where that search and selection, that venture process is still very important and will still continue to play a key role, but there's a couple realities that I think are, are, are forcing this new stage um, which is already beginning to happen, and which Ashoka U and efforts like this are really a key part of. Um, the first reality is that I think there's a, a, almost a tacit assumption early on that um, transformational leaders and organizations would arise and kind of do arise in proportion to the scope and gravity of the social problems that we face. And if that's true, then the sort of um, search and selection process by itself is, is a very powerful um, way of going about things. But in fact, what we've found is that you know there's many very severe, urgent, global problems that are happening today that in many cases we haven't seen um, the type of leadership and organizations emerge that have needed to. Um, but the most sort of obvious example of that is the recent financial crisis. You know. Um, there are deep <coughs> structural economic problems that are at the root of the last crisis in 07 and crises before that and, and almost surely crises that are to follow. Um, and, you know, I think we'd be hard pressed in our own field to point to the really transformational organizations that were working to prevent the crisis that did happen, that are now that it, it, it did happen to make sure that the reform that needs to be passed are going to be passed. Um, unfortunately, there's a huge strategic gap that's present there. And so I think that realization is helping move us on to the next stage. Another realization, and this might be disputed by some, but it's my opinion, is that we're actually, we're actually reaching a point of diminishing returns, where many of the really top-level organizations in different fields and top-level leadership have in many cases been identified. And there are, of course, new ones that are coming out constantly, 
but the rate at which they are rising and the level of quality that we need to be seeing to really be able to take on our most pressing challenges today, it's just not happening right now. It's not happening with the sort of existing ecosystem that's out there. So I think we're at this key transition point in the field where we're moving beyond what I call sort of the hunting and gathering phase of our field. <coughs> moving on to sort of, if you will, like the agricultural or what I call the generative phase. The focus now needs to be, rather than working with the existing ecosystem that's there and just picking out the diamonds in the rough, the challenge now is to create ecosystems that will be able to, to actually launch, nurture, and sustain the next generation of transformational leaders and organizations. And as is sort of immediately obvious, the college campuses are a very, very central part of this next sort of generative phase. Uh, uh, I think that, you know, if you look at a lot of the young social entrepreneurs that are out there, they often have um, a certain balance of qualities that are present. Um, one of them is this incredible idealism, you know. Um, and to be honest, a certain, uh, being to some degree naive about the hardship and the sacrifices that are actually entailed in launching a startup and doing long-term systemic change, you know, it's tough, it's tough. Um, there are many benefits to having gone through it and, and having accrued the wisdom of, of going through that process, but it cuts both ways. So I think that that's part of the equation. Um, but the other part is that they can't be so inexperienced that, it li that their inexperience literally becomes fatal to their startup or that it fatally harms the potential that uh, their organization is gonna have. And so it's really critical. You know, youth takes care of the first part, but the second part, you know, it really depends upon universities creating the space and the support and the structure where people um, who are, you know, early stage social innovators can get real hands-on experiential um, experience uh, work doing this, uh, doing either doing a startup, doing student activism, uh, being part of other startups, because that experience will often make the difference between someone who's idealistic and then will you know, frankly, will fail and will be tremendously disillusioned during that process and burnt out in that process versus someone who has enough experience that they can combine that with their idealism and really create something powerful and create something beautiful. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> a little bit about the case of Plyer's project, um, which I think is not that unusual in terms of uh, there's, a, there's a cohort of different organizations that um, in different fields that came out of uh, the college environment, either were started up during college or right afterwards, have really become leaders in their field. Um, and Plyer's is, I think, representative of, of um, that, that cohort of different organizations. My co-founder, Catherine Chan, and I, we first um, came across the issue of human trafficking when we were seniors at Brown University, so pretty late, actually. Um, like many people, we did not realize that modern-day slavery still existed today. And only, not only did it still exist, it's actually the second largest criminal industry in the world. We had no idea of the scope of the problem and the absolute brutality that exists for people who are in sex trafficking or labor trafficking situations. It doesn't only exist in Thailand and Africa and places like that, but also <coughs> right here in the United States, which has been the focus of a lot of our work in the last years. Um, you know, some people feel that the word slavery is, is maybe a little strong, um, but if you really know what survivors go through, slavery is actually exactly the right word. Um, you know, I never, there's one case that uh, I'll always remember, it was one of our early cases, and uh, it was a 17-year-old girl who was referred to us by the DC Police Department to our client services, and 
she ran away from home when she was 14 years old, uh, an abusive stepfather, uh, was immediately targeted and picked up by a pimp, which is not unusual at all. Uh, the average age uh, first being sex trafficked in the United States is 13, 14 years old. It's very young. Um, and every night of her life, from when she was 14 to when she was 17, when we first uh, met her, she was put out onto the street by that pimp and forced to provide commercial sex to meet a certain quota every single night to bring a certain you know, 500, 600, 700 dollars. You can you know, think of the, the 13 and 14 year olds in your life and imagine what that means for a child that young. Um, so, you know, we, she was re referred to our shelter program and our clients and our staff worked with her to help her get ready for her first night in our shelter. And we discovered that she had literally dozens of scars all over her back uh, from being whipped by a wire coat hanger by her pimp. Every time she didn't meet her quota, um, he punished her by whipping her. And you can, you know, you immediately think about the images from, you know, the slavery in the 1800s of the slaves with the welts and the scars in their back. And so, you know, today slavery is not uh, the same in its legal form, but much of the brutality that existed then is present, unfortunately, today. And there's more people today in modern day slavery than there were even even back in the times of the 1800s and 1700s. Um, so you know when we became aware of this, we were we were really shocked, and we packed up our van after um, we graduated from Brown and moved down to D.C. And um, you know I think like a lot of early stage founders, um, we were just two broke college students in our living room in our apartment. Uh, and it, you know, not the most auspicious beginning, uh, but that's how a lot of that's how a lot of the organizations begin. I mean, they go on to do you know really great things. Um, and uh, thankfully, you know, Plyer's project has come a long way since then. Um, it's been about eight years now, um, and uh, you know, we've been able to have a, a pretty powerful impact on the system response to trafficking in the United States. And you know, we're really beginning to change the face of trafficking. Um, here in the U.S. and uh, in Japan, um, we just to talk through a couple of different things that we do. Um, we uh, one of our major focuses on policy. Uh, we've been able to pass a major landmark um, federal laws around the issue. Uh, we've been able to get dozens of different states to pass their first state laws on trafficking, which is sort of equivalent to. The sort of sweeping legislation that happened across the country around domestic violence in the 1970s. We're we're seeing the same things now around human trafficking. Where, you know, 10 years ago this was not a reality for law enforcement, and now and you know so there's a 12 year old who gets picked up by law enforcement in New York City, and they arrest her and they prosecute a 12 year old, um, and that happened every single night and it still happens in certain parts of the U.S. but rarely now, um, and they arrest her, and they charge her, and they treat her as a criminal. Absolutely insane, you know. If that same child was sexually abused once in the home, you think about how different that response would have been. So, so you know, the policy work and changing that policy paradigm has been really, really important for this issue. Um, we operate the National Human Trafficking Hotline. we we'll process uh, tens of thousands of calls and cases every single year across the country been able to train hundreds of thousands of law enforcement and service providers and military and others, professionals, to really change the initial system response for survivors when they come out of their situation. And we've been able to provide direct services to thousands of survivors um, to help them on their, on their road to recovery. So, you know, looking back, I can really say that, um, you know, we wouldn't be a $30,000 organization, much less a $3 million organization, if it wasn't for the space and the support that um, we got at the university level. Um, but at the same time, you know, back in 2002 at Brown University, um, the space and the support while it was there was fairly limited. And so I can also say that had there been more structured support, more guidance, more mentorship, 
we and the issue of human trafficking in the United States would be far further along than where we are now. Um, so I want to talk through a couple of different things that I, I see as kind of key ingredients um, for university as it's putting together a social entrepreneurship for social innovation program, many of which, frankly, already exist here. I think it's very exciting to hear the work that's happening here, and I'm very excited to see how it, how it develops in the future. Um, clearly, you know, GMU is, is positioning itself to be a real leader in this area. Um, so the first thing is creating a real space for students to be able to engage in the real world experiential learning through doing, through actually doing the work. Um, and this was the primary thing that Brown was able to give to me early on. I actually started a, another nonprofit prior to Polaris and ran it for four years around police brutality issues. And the only reason I was able to do that was because I was, there was a, a structure in place where we were able to create independent um, study courses that were essentially hybrids. So half of the credit was for sort of the practicum component and half of it was for academic work that complemented it. And for me and other leaders in that organization, it would have been impossible to launch this nonprofit and run it as effectively as we did if we weren't essentially being recognized through course credit and therefore time and space being really carved out in what would otherwise be too full of, an, of a purely academic um, course load. And so that space was incredibly important. Frankly, you know, even then I dropped out of college um, for a while and uh, realized I was crazy and re-enrolled eventually, <laughs> but, but the, even then the conflict was enough that it was tough, you know, to find that balance. Um, so I think finding a way structurally to recognize the incredible importance of that learning by doing, of that practicum, you know, um, and, and not just structuring credit around a purely sort of academic um, course system on this, for this particular issue. Uh, you know, second is creating structured support, networks, training, curriculum, a community um, for students who are doing social entrepreneurship uh, or student social innovators. Um, and, you know, that really did not exist as much at Brown University. And, you know, I got to say, in the first five years of Polaris Project, we made Maybe this is an overstatement, but we made almost every mistake in the book. Um, you know, embarrassing to think about some of the things that we did and how we did them. You know, we really learned our lessons. Like, we know our stuff now because we learned the hard way. And frankly, that's how most, start, you know, startups work. Look, for Teach, look at Teach for America. You know, Teach for America, famously incredibly dysfunctional for its entire early period. Now, it was able to get where it is now, but, you know, um, Looking back, um, I certainly say, the cop would certainly say, um, if only, you know, during the university period there was more mentorship, there was more guidance, there was more structured support, um, it would make a huge difference. And so a lot of that's already being created here today, um, clearly at GMU. Uh, so I think, that's, I think that's incredibly important. Um, the third thing I would say is really embedding the social entrepreneurship program in a matrix across disciplines, so not embedding it only in a business school or only in a certain department. Um, you know, the business practices that underlie success are important, um, and some of those practices may or may not come out of a business school, um, but the actual content, the intellectual framework, um, for social entrepreneurs who are attacking a certain issue or field is just as important. And so, you know, I think it's I think it's very valuable to have a program that really is tightly embedded with a lot of different disciplines, because that is just the nature of this type of work. Um, I think it also takes advantage of the fact that there's different cultures that are present in different departments, which is important. Um, and I think it's also just as important for the faculty as it is for the students, you know. There's certain faculty that are already doing social entrepreneurial work, but for many others, the chance for them to work and maybe perhaps you know provide the intellectual framework for what will become a leading organization in a particular field, that's one of the most professionally fulfilling and meaningful things that can happen for faculty. You know, 
books will be published, papers will be written, there'll be the intellectual influence that happens. But to see and to, and to be able to really contribute uh, into a venture that really makes that work come alive is something that I think can be very powerful for the faculty um, as well as obviously for the students. So I think that's important. And the last thing I'll say is, is that, um, you know, figuring out a way to bridge the chasm that exists between being a student social entrepreneur and entering the real world. It's a major stress point, and it's a major point of failure for ventures. And so I think the cutting edge campuses are really thinking about how can we smooth over that transition? How can we make sure that it's not gonna be as much of a stress point? Um, whether that's through creating an incubator, it's attached to the university, um, whether it's through um, creating a more structured system for tying the best performing startups to early sort of venture investment, whether through organizations like Echoing Green or even Ashoka, um, or through alumni. Um, very often there's a lot of alumni that are deeply interested in investing in these organizations. Um, so it's a win-win both ways. Um, or creating social entrepreneur, you know, in residence type programs um, where social entrepreneurs who are more experienced can take a sabbatical and recover from burnout and kind of <laughs> give back to the next generation of folks that are that are coming up from the ranks. Um, so I think that's I think that's very important as well. Um, I'm going to wrap up just by reflecting for a moment um, a little bit on what's really at stake here. You know, why is this so important that we get this right? Um, I think that for our generation, for our children, we're facing a very different future than what was known by our parents. Um, I think there are a series of, of real global crises that are either currently unfolding or are you know, threatening to unfold. Um, and whether you're talking about Climate change, which clearly, you know, poses an almost existential threat, and unfortunately, as we all know, there's been very little progress, meaningful progress, on on slowing it down or mitigating what would be the likely effects of it. Um, you have the deep structural economic problems that have been the cause of, you know, increased economic instability over the last decades, and which I think we're going to see even more crises to come based on uh, the lack of reform, fundamental reform, that's just not happening right now. Um, whether you're talking about peak oil, you know, something that's been known about for decades, um, which there's been woefully little preparation for, um, which is either you know happening or will shortly happen. It will completely transform the energy economy. Um, it will have a, a, a very dramatic series of knock-on effects across the board. You know, deteriorating food systems, major <coughs> regions of, of the world where the water supply that you know, sustains the entire population is on a one way road to being depleted. So, so when you look at the reality of what, what our generation is facing, there's all the issues that have been present for decades, but there's a whole new class of really global um, uh, issues that threaten frankly, you know, collapse, potentially, of major economic, environmental, energy, food systems. So the stakes really could not be higher for this. Um, on the flip side, I would also say, though, that, you know, there's going to be really disjunctive change going into these future years. The world's going to look very different, you know, in the next decades than it has in the last decades. And that actually is a really historic window of opportunity. I think there's going to be a chance to create the type of fundamental systemic changes that frankly have not been, you know, whether you're talking about our economic systems, our relationship with our planet, natural resources, whether you're talking about our systems of governance, there's, there's a chance for a level of fundamental change that I don't think has been politically realistic in the last several decades, frankly, because things have been too stable. So. The picture is dark ahead, but there is great opportunity. And I think a lot of the question of, you know, are we going to be able to turn what, frankly, looks like a pathway towards global tragedy, are we going to turn it into, be able to turn it into a period of really great social progress? 
is very much going to rely upon the question of can we figure out how to create, nurture, and sustain these, this next generation of really transformational leaders and organizations. And I think programs like this are very much going to be at the heart of that effort and whether or not it succeeds in the future. So, thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of these, these issues or about the work of the Project. Thank you. Thank you. So, questions? If you say who you are, that'd be great for all of us. Sorry. <laughs> Just say who you are. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a lot of the idea behind creating a central space for social innovation um, is that it's impossible for each department to be able to have the resources uh, to offer that type of support for students. Um, so I think you actually probably might want to speak to that question a little bit. Well, I just wanted to say, no, please go ahead. Well, what, what resources are available to um, social entrepreneurs here at Mason? I, I'm not familiar. Do we have an incubator? We do. We do? We do. Um, for business or for social? Um, for business, but they will take social ventures. Um, the Small Business Development Center yep. and the Mason Enterprise Center has an incubator program, but I think it does cost money to be a part of. But I mean, let me take the graduate seat question first, which is to say that there are two courses that are being offered at the graduate level right now. One uh, in the uh, public administration. Uh, at, on social entrepreneurship and one of the School of Public Policy um, taught by uh, my colleagues in Changemakers, Alan Abramson and Phil Arswald. So there are some graduate level courses, but your point is well taken regarding our thinking. I, I sort of took what you said today as kind of that filling in a lot of blanks about how the center is going to play out. And I think you're adding an important piece here, which is to say that we have to think about the graduate level support. How do you take your, res your research, your dissertation, et cetera, and kind of transform that into what you were able to do, which has always inspired me, which is to take that work at Brown and transform that into your life path and what you were doing as a, as a professional. I think it's like a best case scenario. So your point is, is well taken. Yeah. Is that a PhD level course though? Because the thing with PhD students is that we can't take, you know, <laughs> master's level courses for graduate credit. For credit. Yeah, I know you can doctoral students in all that course. They do. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, but I wanted to uh, just, just make one additional point in terms of just an example of a moment of opportunity, and there are always the, this one that is the next one, but you may know that the School of Public Policy is moving into a new building, Founders Hall in Arlington. And so that leaves the site that we're currently occupying in a sort of uncertain status. And one of the things that they're discussing is um, having that space be um, co-developed with a commercial developer, uh, but with a function that would serve the university's interest. 
So we have been talking about since the beginning of Chainbreaker Campus, would it be possible to have in Arlington, adjacent to the School of Public Policy and the Law School, a co-working space? Um, and we initially, we were in touch with Club Global, we were thinking about situating it where the old Murphy Coffee, we know the owners there. They're tremendous local entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs. Um, and so that's a resource that also spun off into the conversations that now are part of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the, at the National Mall. That's a new initiative to try to situate uh, that sort of thing at the Arts and Industry Building on the National Mall. But it still leads us at Mason. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening. Hub DC is happening. Uh, there's some interest at the Smithsonian to create a Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation on the National Mall. We don't have anything in Northern Virginia. So what you're raising, I mean, this could be a huge defining uh, opportunity for Mason, whether, and I think Arlington is probably the right place, actually, um, to, to, to become a regional leader in incubating social innovators and social entrepreneurs, not just from our student, among our students, but also throughout the region. So we could do that. We've got a space. We've got some initial kind of potential interest from the provost. Roger Stow was just here. We're just creating for social innovation. We need to really articulate this as a priority across the campus that we really see this as being a vision for Mason in the future. Because there's a lot of other people articulating different visions of Mason in the future. And they are also vocal and enthusiastic. So it's just out there. Yeah. Other questions for Derek, please? Derek, what do you see as the single, sorry, I'll back up. I'm Kristen Evans. I'm an MPA student here. Um, in my professional life, I'm a defense consultant. And so I do feel like I'm at the cusp of where industry intersects with government. Um, and I'm trying to see how it is the nonprofit sector also inter intersects with those sectors. <coughs> um, but what do you see as the single greatest barrier currently for Polaris Project getting to the next level? Is that barrier specific to the work you're doing in human trafficking? Or is it um, something that all social entrepreneurs are running up against currently? And what do you think is the way to get past that, that big barrier that you're facing currently? Mm, that's a question. Um, there's a lot of sort of generic issues that every organization faces, obviously fundraising, things like that. I'm, I'm not gonna go into that, because uh, that is, I think, fairly generic. I think that, um, one of the deep problems that we face in the nonprofit sector and um, uh, in general in sort of the social change space is there's a tremendous fragmentation that exists um, where each organization is working within its own field and even within its own field each organization is working on its own mission you know? um, and you know, there's a there's kind of a, a broad awareness that all these different organizations and fields are part of this sort of macro movement that's pushing for greater global justice, and, you know, humanitarian ends and um, environmental sustainability, but um, that's not how it actually functions um, day to day. And so, you know, to be honest, it's insane. <laughs> I mean, it's completely insane. If you look at it, you know, can you imagine a political party that um, you know, had local offices throughout the country, but the local offices only worked on local elections and refused to pitch in for state and national elections, you know, because it was too diffuse or indirect or their resources weren't enough. You know, it's crazy. I mean, it wouldn't survive, you know, a year. And that's the reality of this space. Um, so it, it's absolutely insane, and we need to move to, and this is, and this is why, the next generation, particularly of leaders and organizations, is so crucial because there needs to be a fundamental change in the way that this work is done so that there is actual meaningful strategic coordination between different fields and there's meaningful um, political um, coordination so that the power that's represented in the overall space, which, which you know, if you compare the money and the organizations and the people in what I'll generally call sort of the more progressive NGO type space versus say the more conservative think tanky world and all the different institutions that exist there. There's more money and power over here. But that's obviously not how things have played out. Um, and, so, and that's because the movement conservatives, for example, have operated much more focusing on systemic change. They've focused on a big vision, which they work on together. There's much more of a sense of 
unified macro mission that their macro sort of movement they're all part of, and they've unified their political and sort of strategic um, operations to a far greater extent than we have on the left. So, you know, we can make whatever progress we can make in the trafficking field, but um, all the other issues that sustain the reality of trafficking and substitute your issue, homelessness, whatever it is, you know, those are things that are shared across the board. So like this financial crisis, you know, um, mo most trafficking organizations, if, if they were asked to, to pitch in even 5% of their time and to say, um, helping be part of a broad coalition to get financial reform passed, would say, hells no, you know, this is not part of our mission. The board, their boards wouldn't allow it. I mean, it's just not done. You don't do it. You're a trafficking organization. Um, well, the reality is that with the level of unemployment that exists now, the level of cuts that have happened to um, local services, uh, et cetera, across the country, you know, the level of homeless children has gone up dramatically. Therefore, the level of human trafficking and sex trafficking, in our case, in the U.S., has gone up dramatically. Um, you know, these things are all very interconnected. Right. And so I think that's, that I view as a big challenge for Polaris Project, is how can we begin to create those meaningful strategic and political um, sort of alliances. And it's a huge challenge for the entire sector. Great question. Great answer. Uh, an example of systemic <laughs> thinking uh, that we all need to raise our sights up to that level. I'm not sure what time it is, but is there another question for Derek? I just wanted to present there with a really good Dad, you mentioned that there's been a, a push to, to sort of, oh, sorry, I'm going to pop back up again. <laughs> My name is Ryan Gull, and I'm also in the MBA program. Um, and I'm actually in one of those courses, the Social Entrepreneurship Class in the Wings. And, um, but, uh, but you mentioned earlier that there's been a push to get local ordinances and also um, state, statewide um, laws put on the books to um, to you know sort of prohibit um, this this uh, human trafficking. Um, but are there other laws that you face that you come into conflict with? And I'm specifically thinking of the way some laws might be written in regards to prostitution or or just other um, other other law yeah just laws related to that that you might face at some point that. The way they're currently in the books actually causes more harm in which you might go about aiding um, and aiding somebody who doesn't need your help versus sort of you mentioned where you know initially a lot of individuals were being picked up the street and being prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think there's two things. There's there's a legal framework that's existed for over a century, which in the U.S. at least criminalizes all aspects of the sex industry, in this case, if we're looking at the sex industry. Um, so, you know, if you're providing commercial sex, that's illegal. If you're managing sort of an operation, if you're pimping or a madame or something like that, it's illegal. And if you're buying commercial sex, it's illegal. Um, so that's the legal framework. The actual practice has been to focus enforcement on people who are providing commercial sex. And generally speaking, not on the other two uh, components. Um, which, you know, you can quickly see is, is rather problematic. Um, and, um, and then if you look at it in the situation of children versus adults, um, by and large, what has happened is that children who are commercially sexually exploited have not traditionally been treated as such and have been treated as adults who are um, committing the crime of prostitution. So one of the big shifts that's happened over the last Ten years in the U.S. at the federal level, state, and local level, um, is that one? There's been changes in the actual legal framework, um, where the trafficking laws are have been passed and are taking precedence over how a case should be treated um, that might otherwise be treated purely as prostitution. Um, and two, and this is very kind of cutting edge stuff, even though it's incredibly obvious um, to any sort of thinking, feeling human being is that states are beginning to decriminalize children who are commercially sexually exploited. So Illinois, for example, is the first state that just passed 
um, a law that decriminalizes uh, someone who's under 18 um, who's being sex trafficked um, so that they won't be arrested and prosecuted, but will instead be treated as, as a victim. Um, but, you know, parallel to this, these legal changes, there's been a dramatic shift in behavior um, and in uh, sort of general law enforcement approach and the approach in the justice system where um, more and more cases, they may be picked up initially as prostitution cases, but if there's any, uh, due to training and, and other things, if it's recognized and identified as trafficking, then it changes the paradigm and the person who was arrested then becomes a, a victim witness in either a federal or state case, and then they begin to go after the trafficker. Um, there's also been an increasing emphasis on achieving more parity with the demand side, so not just going after people who are providing commercial sex, often who don't have much control over their situation, um, but instead going after the demand side, going after jobs that are you know, the source of the money for the entire industry. Um, so that, that shift is beginning to happen, which is long overdue. Um, and you know, we're still at the relatively early stages, but um, I think 50 years from now, it's gonna be a total sea change um, just like if you look at domestic violence back in the 50s and 60s, police showed up and, you know, it's a, it's a domestic disturbance, arrest both parties. You know, you think about how that works now. So we're, we're in the process of going through that same really fundamental transformation in both the legal framework and in the actual practice. Other questions? to get involved in the feeder, in the, in the field more broadly, in the movement more broadly, but also with Blair's project. Um, something I mentioned earlier is our fellowship program. So we have a program that uh, basically takes people who are really interested in entering the, the, the field um, and we place them in various departments of our organization, either in policy or client services or training and infrastructure building, etc. And we give them uh, very extensive upfront training, and then they're just dive into doing, you know, in many cases pretty high level work, actual programmatic work. It's not like an internship where you're kind of doing, you know, paperwork and stuff like that. Um, and so our fellows are drafting state legislation along with our, you know, attorneys on staff, are helping serve clients, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we're always looking for really committed, passionate people um, who can be part of that fellowship program. A lot of those folks have gone on into different organizations in the field, into different leadership positions um, across the field afterwards. Um, uh, so that's that's certainly one way of, of getting involved. Um, other ways of getting involved are raising awareness, publicizing the national hotline um, is something that is incredibly important and really happens primarily at the grassroots level. You know, most of the calls that we get in that trigger major cases federally. Um, come from just people in the community who see something and they were told about the hotline and, and so that, that grassroots level of awareness raising is actually really critical um, to, to that entire mechanism nationally working properly. So that's another way to get involved. Um, there's fundraising and things like that that are also, of course, always helpful. <laughs> but those are two of the more substantive ways that I sort of think off the top of my head. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, um, I actually, you mentioned decriminalization in Illinois of uh, child sex trafficking. How does it work in practice in states like Nevada, where you have almost wholesale decriminalization of uh, sex trafficking or prostitution? Um, you know, does that, is that an ideal situation for you guys doing your work, or is it with more light being shined? No, not at all. It not makes all. it much yeah. worse. I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. That. And that the, the whole state of Nevada is actually not decriminalized. It's just certain counties. Certain counties, right? Yeah. yeah. So, like Las Vegas, for example, is not decriminalized. Um, uh, it's very problematic because it's um, there's a big difference between decriminalization for people who are providing commercial sex 
but retaining criminalization of people who are buying in, on the control side mm -hmm. uh, versus blanket decriminalization. So the most progressive countries like Sweden have really pioneered um, the model where they decriminalize just the people who are, who are providing commercial sex and, and instead they provide them with services and assistance, but then really go after Johns and, and pimps and traffickers. Um, that's the best model. The countries that have done more blanket decriminalization have seen dramatic rises in sex trafficking, um, uh, frankly, because you know there's a huge increase in demand, and where there's a huge increase in demand, supply follows. And in many cases, those countries that um, and areas that have legalized, uh, there's a very limited pool of folks who are in any meaningful situation of wanting to be in the sex industry. So that gap between the demand and supply is met by trafficking. So that's been true in you know, the Netherlands and different areas, including in, in counties in Nevada, um, where there's, you know, it's more tightly regulated in theory, but the reality is many of the women that are part of the sort of well-known brothels out there are actually either under pimp control, um, or it's, it's also been discovered that the actual conditions in many of those brothels are very controlling. You know, there's a lot of different mechanisms that limit the meaningful freedom of the women who are who are at those particular bonds. So not helpful. So let's have one more question. I want to respect all of <coughs> I wanted uh, just a number or percentage, how many people are involved, how, what's the percentage of uh, uh, women or, or any kind of sure, number you could sure. give me, um, percentage, either one, whatever works. Sure. Um, the numbers globally, uh, the best number, there's a lot of different statistics out there. And statistics for an issue like this are hard, are hard to come by because of the nature the of States, the kind of nature of the issue. The global number is that it's estimated there's around 12.4 million people in situations of modern day slavery. In the US, it's estimated that there is at least around 100,000 children, they're mostly US children, that are in situations of commercial sexual exploitation. <laughs> many of which, um, all of which are functionally trafficking, many of which meet the legal definition of trafficking. Um, and a lot, again, a lot of those children are children who are running away from abusive homes. Um, and about 75% of girls that run away at an early age are targeted within 36 hours by pimps. It's a very high rate. I mean, if you're 14 years old and you're on the street, I mean, you know, you're at a bus stop, you're wherever, what else are you going to do? Who else is going to take care of you? And that's unfortunately the reality. Um, in terms of foreign nationals that are brought into the country and then put in trafficking situations, um, the numbers are estimated around 10 to 20,000 people in labor trafficking and sex trafficking situations. Is there, I'm sorry, is there a difference between sex and labor in terms of the horrific conditions or your battle to fight? Either one, is there a... Um, there's, there's different dynamics uh, that are often present. Um, many, of the, many of the basic features are very similar. Uh, labor trafficking can be very brutal. Um, I, th I think some of the trauma can be a little different in terms of how, how it's experienced and the, and the process afterwards. But um, in many cases in labor trafficking, especially uh, if it's a woman who's being labor trafficked, there's very often sexual abuse and assault um, that's present as well. Um, so there's, there's a good amount of crossover that often happens.